Good evening. I should say late afternoon. Nice sunny late afternoon in the skybox at the corner of the level. This is Res Mason. Welcome back to Wireworld Wednesdays. I'm trying to get better at my spiel about why I'm doing this. And I think I'm going to start every episode with a quick recap. For everyone who hasn't seen it before, this app is called the Wireworld Player. And I think you can find it. Let me find out. <laughs> you can find the old one, the Flash one, in any search engine. And because it requires Flash, it does not work. And we are replacing it with this one, which is hosted on GitHub. It is completely JavaScript. There's these controls to play and pause and step through it. And as you can see, as we do that, it evolves over time very quickly, actually. So if I step through it, we can get a better sense of what it's doing. Something's going on, right? And what's happening is we've got four colors, which I will call dead, wire, head, and these dim ones, tail. We've got four colors in this image. And these colors evolve all together by following four simple rules. And those rules apply to every pixel at the same time. Oops. The dead cells stay dead forever. So all this background color never changes, which is great because if any of these rules allowed dead cells to change, then some of these patterns that we see flickering in the image could leak out of the image. And we would have to worry about this piece of paper getting bigger and bigger and expanding and all this interesting stuff kind of spilling out onto the background. We don't have to worry about that because of this first rule. Dead cells stay dead. Tail cells become wires. Let's look at that. So here's a bunch of wire cells. These orange ones are tail cells, and as we step through them, tails always go from tail to wire. And next to them, head cells always become tail. Like that. The interesting part is wire cells becoming head cells, which we call excited. A wire cell is excited if it has one or two head cell neighbors. So you see this bend in the wire. We can watch this electron head trigger excitation along the wire because these pixels are all neighbors. They're in a line. They're in a wire. Wire world is full of wires, but it's also full of things that are not wires, that are shaped kind of like wires, but are different. And this flickering is a demonstration of a design in wire world being used to force signals together to perform logic. That's one of the reasons why our world exists. It's a system for making pixely circuits that have this interesting, chaotic behavior. I mean, it's principled, but it's, it's chaotic in that looking at it, even though it's deterministic, in this case, we, we really can't tell very easily what it's going to do from this state to the state, you know, maybe a hundred generations from now or a thousand generations from now. That behavior is constrained to these wires. That's what makes Wireworld special. And 
its ability to support circuit-like concepts is its um, raison d'etre. Anyway, here's what's in store for us today. The code that we wrote right at the end of last week's stream runs pretty well. But there's no speed control, and we want to be able to adjust its speed so that at the slowest speed, it evolves the circuit at maybe one generation per second, something like that. And at its fastest, it goes at, it goes at this speed, which is called the, uh, the request animation frame speed, the animation loop which is built into every browser. All of this is stuff that's just baked into every browser. So, preamble. Why am I doing this? Well, I need to make the JavaScript version of the Flash Wireworld player that I made 10 years ago. Right, forgot about that. Um, to revisit something I liked 10 years ago forgot about that. I programmed things for different reasons 10 years ago, and I like revisiting that. That's just a personal thing. Um, so yes, I need to remake this thing. It is an educational web app, so anyone who just hits this URL can run Wireworld in a browser. They don't need to install anything, so there's no install friction. Uh, 15, 16 years ago, um, somebody made drivey.com and drivey is a driving simulator and to enjoy it all you had to do is download it and you can see in the corner of the screen the download link still links to an exe file so if you ran windows or if you ran linux, ran linux and had wine installed you could share this download link anywhere on Slashdot, for instance, that's where it was shared uh, famously. And it would immediately download. This isn't a great idea with uh, executables nowadays because that could be a way to infect your computer. But you could immediately download it. It was, you know, 300K, less than 300K, and immediately run it and see it for what it was. Nowadays, this isn't so much an option if people are trying to, you know, I guess follow the rules of the way that their OSs ship. Not everybody does, I don't, but um, alternatively, the web has become more and more expressive. So by porting these things to the web, you get rid of the same install friction. If there's something you want to share with somebody, the web is a great way of doing it, not just with text and images and hot takes and terrible, terrible political opinions, but also with interactive experiences. Here's another example. Uh, I make a bunch of these. I like them. I like making it really easy to share something that I think provokes people to think about stuff. I don't know. So, no install friction. Uh, the Flash player version doesn't work anymore because Flash is effectively gone from the web and there's no online alternatives. It falls on me to do this because it's my work. Also, why am I streaming? Well, I want to program in a JS-like language in public. In other words, I want to code something that people can watch and be like, okay, I, I'm following along. Um, it's not absolutely horrible to look at this for long periods of time. And honestly, if you think that uh, the project could go in a different direction, if you think it could be improved, by all means, fork it. It's on GitHub. Uh, in fact, that is how it runs. It is just hosted on GitHub. Um, there it is. So, you know, if you like, fork away. 
I want to pro I want to portray programming realistically. Um, Society is not great at this. They like they like portraying programmers as these know-it-alls who just type really fast and they know what they're typing, so everything works out. But it doesn't. Um, you know, I probably average maybe a hundred words a minute, and I probably average. Uh, 20 typos a minute. Fortunately, the tools that we use to program uh, make it easier to avoid simple mistakes, and other tools make it a little easier to avoid harder mistakes. But making mistakes and learning things is part of the process. That needs to be represented. Also, I just want to hype Wireworld. I love this stuff. It's really neat that this is a computer. Like this picture, which was developed by um, Mark Owen and I think David Moore. This, I need to fix this. Maybe I'll do that during the stream today um, at Al. Maybe there's more contributors, I, I don't know. But, you know, someone designed this and for it to continue to work online in 2021 matters to me. And I want people to be able to enjoy it. Uh, the stream gives me a chance to do different kinds of storytelling. Uh, storytelling is a big deal for me. It's the way we live through narrative. There's the narrative of explaining and teaching something, which is kind of what I'm doing right now. You will be able to watch me make something, obviously, but learn how to do it. Like, I don't know how to do all of the things. So I, I want to be able to learn right here in front of you. Uh, the mistakes will be all over the place. Some of them are already in place and just need to be discovered and fixed. That's another kind of narrative. And then a program running is another kind of narrative. This is this is pedantic, but you know, matters to me. Anyway, um, I've explained what Wireworld is and why it exists. Um, to reiterate, the design of Wireworld, the rules that this world runs on, Make sure that whatever it does, it doesn't escape this little box. It's well behaved, and it does interesting things inside. And then there's the guiding principles for the stream. So ideally, the code has to be readable, simple, and practical. I've got my own code convention. It it might not be what they do at Google, it might not be what they do at Airbnb or all these other places where programming standards are devised. Um, but everything does get kind of crammed through a styling system called Prettier so that whatever code I write, it'll have some consistency when I'm done. Um, once this thing works, and you know, it just barely works right now. I'm going to do some more things so that it's not just, you know, barely working. I'll get the speed slider to work and stuff like that. Um, but I also want it to work fast. And for this stream, once I get some other stuff out of the way, I'm interested in exploring... I mean, I, I already have some of these uh, optimization strategies figured out, so it'll probably be a lot of explaining and programming rather than learning new things. Um, but I will make mistakes. So, um, the strategies that we're interested in today are specific to this system. Um, there's plenty of ways to make a browser, you know, a web app run faster, do things more efficiently with the resources of the system that it's running on. This is not about that. This isn't about putting it on the GPU, this isn't about, you know, WebAssembly or web workers. This is about thinking of ways to make the actual job of applying these rules to this world more streamlined. 
I might need to download something so I can draw on like a virtual whiteboard before um, before getting into it. Later on, we'll look into the strategies for speeding up this sort of thing. Um, overall, I want it to be as transparent as possible. In other words, the source code and the ins and outs of the whole system should be easy to to look at. It should be easy to you know pop the hood on this thing and look inside. Uh, I forgot this one, accessible UI UX. So. As you can see, there are features in place that hopefully make the entire app accessible to people who don't necessarily use the web with a mouse or even a keyboard. Um, it's a live thing, so you know what we're looking at right now is hosted live. And as we commit and push to, um, what's this? Remove. As we push to the repo, this website will update in real time. And so hopefully I don't break the build. It's probably inevitable, but I'll keep trying to make sure that doesn't happen. And lastly, because I'm new to streaming, don't share personal info by mistake. Let's see. Someone in chat last week recommended that I make sure that whatever search system I use also has safe search turned off, stuff like that. So, you know, there's there's some streaming stuff that I'm still figuring out. Do I want to dive into this? So before going into the code, save, close. Maybe it would be helpful to go through some of the content that is copyrighted by the owner of Quinopolis, which I think is... One second. Right, Dr. Mark Owen. So one of the two authors of the Owen Moore computer um, at some point created this website to explain the ins and outs of Wireworld and how to go from the basic principles that I just highlighted all the way to their final design for a computer. So we've covered this, dead, wire, head, and tail. Dead stays dead, head becomes tail, tail becomes copper, copper becomes head if it has one or two head neighbors, which allows an electron to, huh, one second. I see, that one wasn't animated. So here we see a signal represented by a head tail pair propagating along a wire. You can split them very easily. If you think about it, both of these wires are excited where they connect to this wire. This cell has two wire neighbors and when it is excited, these two neighbors are excited. I should say it has three wire neighbors. It has this one, this one, and the one behind it. But often the design of wire world systems emerge into patterns such that the head and tail are always pointed in the same exact way along a particular wire. It's possible to use a wire in Wireworld to send a signal one way and then the other way, but very few designs do this. Also notice 
these electrons on this wire are evenly spaced. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Timing is extremely important in programming. There is a clock that governs the speed at which computers can calculate. And that is true of Wireworld as well. If you create a system in Wireworld that gets something done, chances are you are organizing it in a way that makes sure electrons are only ever kind of six units in, in multiples of six units along the wires. So that every, every addition, every subtraction, every logical operation happens in kind of like time steps of six, which gives you a lot of space between these things for routing, for logical, you know, component design. Um, anyway. Now, this arrangement of wires is called a diode because electrons that come in on the thick side propagate out the narrowing side, but it doesn't work the other way. So a diode is a great way of making sure that a wire never propagates information in the wrong direction. Depending on how we design wire world, you know, images, we can get away with not using diodes if we, again, make sure every wire kind of goes in the same direction. But inevitably, some things that are wire-like encounter things that are diode-like when we are performing operations on the signals that are being passed around. Oh, and to see why this works, let's watch this electron. The head reaches this cell. It has three wire neighbors. They all get excited. They share two wire neighbors that get excited and they share one wire neighbor that gets excited. Now let's look at this other row. An electron head enters this cell. It has two wire neighbors that get excited. And then those two excited wire neighbors excite three wire neighbors. They get excited but they share one wire neighbor. And because three is too many neighbors for this cell to get excited, the signal stops here. From this, you can start constructing things like an OR gate, an exclusive OR gate, an AND NOT gate. You can imagine Little by little, the designers of the Wireworld computer came up with basic components that they could then arrange into more complex configurations of cells. And this is very much like circuitry. This happens to be read-only memory. You see how some of these components have a left ear and no right ear, and some of them have a left ear and a right ear. The presence or absence of that ear is essentially a zero or a one stored in this read-only memory. And so by sending a signal, let's call it northwest, through this uh, column of ROM, they in turn send signals northeast, or they don't, depending on the presence or absence of that ear. So this is an example of read-only memory. You might recognize it from their design. Here's some read-only memory. And you can see there's one of these arrays for each of the seven segment displays. And each of these has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ROM components in a column. And you can see one goes to this, one goes to this, one goes to this. There are seven segments that can light up individually in these displays. In other words, this ROM converts 
a digit, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or the other way around, I'm not sure, can convert that digit to an arrangement of segments in this fake LED display to light up. Anyway, this is, this is how designs are built from smaller pieces. And actually, a lot of programming solutions are based on making uh, progress on smaller problems and then combining their solutions to solve the bigger problem. Anyway, again, that uh, this website, quinopolis.com slash yindex.html is copyright 2004-2021 Dr. Mark Owen, whose computer I hope to... Well, I guess it's already alive again, but we're going to make it... We're going to make it better than this. Anyway... So let's see. First things first, there's a bug that I want to fix. Okay, hang on. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to update this. Give me one sec. Nothing like a freshly updated text editor. Right. If we go here in Firefox, there's just a small UI bug that I discovered the other day. There it is. So the code that governs this focus, look at that, there's like a blinking line right there. I'm going to reset the page, actually, I'm going to close the tab and revisit the page and I'll hit tab. Okay. There. There's a blinking line. And actually, it might be... Oopsie. It might be on all of these. Or not. That's so weird. Firefox, HTML, element, focus, Blinking line. Oops. One second. Um, search. Oh, search. Likely caused by switching on carrot browsing. What? Um, huh. Oh, look at that. It's even in this page. Okay, cool. Not a bug. I just need to turn off carrot browsing, whatever that is. Two 
Okay, guess I'll try the keyboard shortcut that everyone's doing. F7. And that will go in here. That seems to have addressed it. Yeah, weird. Okay, so it was never a Wireworld issue. It was a Firefox issue. Glad to hear it. What else was I going to do? Ah, wireworld.js. So, loaded files. At the moment, when... At the moment when something new is loaded into Wireworld, that. The file gets saved, it gets cached, so it doesn't have to get reloaded. But actually I don't want that. Because when someone uses an application, like if you think about it, imagine you're using, you know, um, I don't know, MS Paint. No, that's a terrible example. Okay, yeah. Say you're using MS Paint to edit image, right? And you're also sharing that image with your friends in a web browser. If you make a change to the image outside of the browser and then drag and drop it back into the browser to share with your friends, you don't want it to use the cached version of your image. You want it to load it from your... Just a little quieter. You want it to load it freshly from your local storage again. So I'm actually going to get rid of this loaded files cache. And... Where's data? Got it. Data equals all of this. Get rid of that. Press file. Web Inspector, Debugger, there it is, huh, oh right, <laughs> this is the version on the internet, I am running this locally, so I will start a server in my repo, Try that again, but localhost. Data equals. There we go.
completely overrides the old data. That's what we want. This should work. <laughs> go, little guy, go. Okay. That was weird. Huh. So that works. Just more pointless focus issues. That's another issue. It makes the most sense for play pause to be the space bar, but okay, that's an accessibility issue. I will figure that out later. That's not what today is about. Oh, you know what? I can fix this. So, GUI JS, GUI Utils, key down. I can detect spacebar. There it is. Listen to button. Space. And then key mapping. From GUI utils. Okay, so let's just try this. If key code equals space, right? Just absolutely nothing. Or key code equals here. I'm not sure what the key code is for enter and return.
console.log code. And we're just going to see what codes there are. There's a bunch. Enter, numpad enter. Those are the ones I want. Hmm. Const key codes handled by browser focus equals new set space and then key codes handled by browser focus dot I think it's has key code console.log don't worry about it no it's not this it's okay I'm not going to worry about those because I'm not using them. Just going to simplify. If key code is space, and the button's focused, um, HTML element is focused. has focus, get out of here. Active element. Probably use that elsewhere. Active element. I do. Cool. So, if it's a space and button is the document's active element, then we just return. There we go. That ought to fix it. Oh, actually... Doesn't matter what the document's active element is, if it's anything, then we return. That's more like it. Interesting. Oh, that's why. <laughs> Gotta move it into here. Might as well also do document.active element tag name to upper case. Body. Okay. So isn't equal to document dot body um I don't like this either so GUI active element there it is
let's try this again. If it's a space, then... Actually... If it's a space and there's a focused element... about whether they're focusable or something, right? HTML button MDN. Focus. Mm, nope. One second, got to turn on the fan. So the thing about buttons, A tags, and inputs is they're like automatically focusable. MDN tab index button. Here we go. Built in roles. So MDN button role. actually get some insight into this. It is a button. Okay. MDN button form. So the button element has a form attribute. What else has a form attribute? Maybe input. It does. But does div? It does not. Okay. And chances are body doesn't either. 
Okay, so maybe we can do this. If document.activeElement.has own property form return. It's a little gross, but that basically means that the UI elements that make up the interface should Okay, space, pause. Space, nuts. One second. So, um, that's odd. Oh, my bad. Right, this should be code. And it should go in here. Active element. Tag name is a button. Okay. And let's just find out if this is true. Don't give me that. I know what I'm doing. I see. Allow pasting. There we go. Is false. Document.activeElement.form Ah, it doesn't have its own property form, but is form in document.activeElement. It is. Okay. This is gross. Let me try this again. So document active element form isn't equal to undefined. I think that's what we want. Sorry, triple equals no. Let's try that. Reset. There we go. Okay. Gross. But did the trick. Okay, one fix at a time. So removed cache of loaded files so that changes to files are 
loaded in kind of awkward commit message. You know what? Let me run prettier too. No change. Okay. Um, the space bar no longer Spacebar, keyboard shortcut, no longer conflicts with default behavior of hitting the spacebar when a focused element has focus. No, when a button-like element has focus. Cool. I probably should test that on other browsers though. Uh, localhost. Play. Pause. Play. Pause. Click out. Play. Pause. Nice. Um, I might want to create an additional keyboard shortcut besides play pause, but I will worry about that later. We got some stuff to do. So, at the moment, we drive this whole thing from the engine. Quick reminder what the engine is. This web app is made from ECMAScript modules, mostly just for uh, organization of code. I try to keep things single responsibility, but I'm, I'm trying not to overthink it in this project. We have a method called advance, and actually, Let's isolate advance. So start, we'll call run, const run equals advance, and then if playing, we run again, and again, and again, and again. So that's self-contained, which is nice. Yeah. Because advance is exposed to the rest of the app through the engine. So instead of having this um, request animation frame logic in there, it'll be in run. Also, run is a good verb for engines. You can start an engine and you can run an engine. Now then, console.log speed. We have a speed, right? Yes. So, Let's quickly find out in the console speed right now is zero and it can go all the way to one. Okay, so if speed is exactly equal to one, no, it's greater than or equal to one then we're going to use request animation frame to make it happen again. So only when it's all the way to rabbit do we do that. 
but otherwise we want to govern its speed in a different way with what JavaScript calls set timeout. But I want to compare this to request animation frame. Before the next repaint, how fast does request animation frame? Yeah, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. So, request animation frame happens literally as fast as the browser repaints the page. Everything else should be proportional to that, but I don't know what that value is. I could do this. Um, request animation frame measure. This is weird, but it'll work. So measure const measure equals I wonder if I should use performance.now for this. Yeah, you know what? I will. So... Let's do this right in here. So... Let's start... Nope. Const start equals performance.now. Quest animation frame. Const duration equals performance dot now minus start. Console dot log duration. Let's just see what this does. Eleven. I'm going to assume that that's milliseconds. Duration MS. 
So that tells us how much time has elapsed since doing this request animation frame. Speed needs to be converted into a delay. So I'm going to do const min speed equals a thousand milliseconds. Um, I should say max delay ms is a thousand and then delay ms is that This is going to lead to a stack overflow. Let's just try this for now. Uh, I'll comment that out and set timeout. Okay, so const delay ms equals and for now I'm going to say const min delay ms equals um, This really ought to be pinned to the request animation frame delay. So delay ms equals Probably no interpolation function on math. Which isn't really necessary anyway. Ramp. Okay. JavaScript, math, ramp. I know it's between 0 and 1, so min delay ms. Oh, but I also don't know what scale I want. Like maybe it should be logarithmic or something. Okay, I'm overthinking this. Um, delay ms equals min delay ms times 1 minus speed plus max delay ms times speed. So that's a linear interpolation between the minimum and maximum milliseconds for the specified speed. And then set timeout. Um, I need to look this up again. MDN set timeout. Function then delay. So um, run delay ms
Okay. I mixed that up. So min delay is actually max speed, but okay. So there we go. So now one, two, three, and I speed it up twice as fast, a little bit faster, but yeah, it should be logarithmic or something. So right now we've got y equals x between 0 and 1. There we go. So we're interested in here to here. Let's try y equals log x plus one. Nope. Square root of x. I think that's what we want. Const. x equals math dot square root of speed. Try that. No. Okay, so instead of square root, which is POW speed 0 0.5, let's try. y equals x zero point two five which is the quadruple root This feels nice, but I think there's a better function. So maybe 1 over x, 1 minus 1 over x. x minus 1, oops, x plus 1. That's not better at all. Okay. So let's try this. Um, delay MS equals max delay MS. And then whenever the speed changes, Delay MS equals, okay, and then we recalculate the speed there, we compute to delay, let's try that. Okay, cool. Also, index.html, uh, speed 
instead of a value of 0, I'm going to set it to a value of 1 for starters. Oh. Um. Nan. And then recompute delay MS. Oh. Max delay MS. Or no, sorry, min delay MS. And then in start. Recompute delay MS. Const recompute delay MS equals there. Play. Well, I was wrong. Oops. In here. Engine recompute. Speed is zero. Delay is a thousand. Speed is still zero. Speed is still zero. So the UI is misreporting the value of speed. Set rhythm from wireworld.js set rhythm state changed from GUI speed. There it is. Not sure I like that. Here's what I'll do. The GUI's initial speed will be based on so turbo will be based on whether turbo is checked and speed will be based on speed slider dot value but speed slider is I see. I'll change this to range inputs dot speed dot value. And in GUI.js, I will check that that's correct. Um, initial state. Close, but no cigar. So this needs to be parse float. There we go. So now the initial state of the UI is based. Hmm. There we go. I still don't like that 
Okay, hang on. Pow. I'm gonna try... One over a hundred. Too steep, one over ten. Yeah, okay. I'm going to stick it to I'm just going to stick with that for now. I don't really have a clever name for this. So, this is still a linear interpretation. But um Oh, uh, Joseph Sachs, thanks for watching. Is there a place for test-driven development in your development process? For this project, no, not really. Um, at the moment, it's primarily UI, right? It's basically an HTML file with some CSS, and the amount of JavaScript that isn't just tightly coupled to the UI is actually pretty slim. But these are things that should be tightly coupled to the UI. Uh, the pan zoom gesture, the GUI initialization, stuff like that. Um, these are things that, you know, could theoretically be tested, but the test framework to support that would be comparable in size to the size of the project, like the existing JavaScript. Um, we could hypothetically do some test-driven development in Engine.js. At the moment, I don't see a use for it. I am a huge fan of test-driven development in certain circumstances, when there's a lot of business logic. And technically, Engine.js is where business logic goes. Like this advanced method could actually be um, plugged into some sort of test to make sure that it does everything it's supposed to in every circumstance. We will not be doing that. You know, there are projects that I've got that I'm working on that, oh, I can't show you because it's a private repo, but, you know, there's a board game that I'm making. Board games have rules. Those rules need to work correctly um, for every player that's playing, and if it's multiplayer, then that's more complicated, and if there's a computer opponent, it's more complicated, and so having small tests that verify that the rules and the strategies that basically comprise that video game are working the way that they should, that they're specified, has tremendous value. Some of the best code that I wrote, ever, arguably, is in that project and is thoroughly tested. But not all of the code is tested. The majority of the UI is not tested. And because Wireworld Player JavaScript is currently mostly UI, um, and will probably be, um, you know, heavily UI for the entirety of the, of the project. I don't think 
any TDD or test-driven development is going to make it in? Good question, though. You know, nobody interpret that as a reason not to do test-driven development in your project. Your mileage may vary. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. What's that? Test the UI in something like Selenium, if that still exists. I will say this, if I do want to throw this into something like Selenium, the focusability of components plays into that because I wouldn't need to make sure the window is just the right size and script mouse events. Although if I were to s test it exhaustively, that's one way I could do it. Um, but you know, the ability to say, I have selected the step button, step, step, step. Um, that accessibility assists in automated UI testing at least a little bit. Helps you make a structured, um, a structured whatchamacallit, test framework. So theoretically it is possible to run this through something like that. Um, as a kind of hobbyist project, it's not something that I've prioritized. It definitely makes sense if, like, this had in-app purchases, right? <laughs> because, you know, then the ways that somebody could use this app would have financial ramifications. And then I would be liable... Anyway... Um, right, let's get into the nitty-gritty by downloading or finding some kind of online whiteboard to write on. Oh. Another thing I hope to never do is, uh, unless it's a multiplayer online game, I hope to never force someone to create an account on one of my web projects. I'm guessing all of these require accounts. New whiteboard. Wire world plans. Oh, wait a minute. Nickname. Wire world plans. Um, July 14th. Optimization strategies for wire. Oopsie. Huh. I don't know. I don't know what the difference is between these. Um, geez iPad landscape? Create? Okay. Not sure how I feel. Oh, oh, okay. Not using that. Let's try just some basic text edit instead. That was disappointing, huh? Okay, so... This ties into... The optimization strategies that are Wireworld specific. So, the way that this app runs is by calling this function as often as possible. And I'm just going to go through it again. We have a 2D grid, right? We have a, a, a picture full of pixels, and it's got a width and a height. And we can think of it as a 2D grid, right? Here's the columns, here's the rows. So, for every row in the height and for every column in the width, 
we look at the current state of that cell, which is either dead, tail, head, or wire. And depending on what it is, we apply the appropriate rule. Dead stays dead, tail becomes wire, head becomes tail, and then the tricky one, wire becomes head if it has one or two head neighbors. And here we have a labeled for loop. We loop over, uh, basically we go, you know, for every cell that is a wire, let me repeat that, for every single cell in this image that is a wire, we have it look at all of its neighbors. Even this cell, we have it look at its neighbors. And every single time we advance, each of these cells look at it, looks at their eight neighbors and counts the heads. And if there's one or two heads, then it continues. Now, we do have a tiny optimization right here. If the number of head neighbors is three, then we know we can stop counting. Because we already know we have too many. But boy, this is a lot of work to do for every single wire in this image. Every single frame. But also, in a way, we're doing a whole lot of work for cells that never change, too. Let me do this. Um, advance. Uh, we're going to say let dead cells equal zero. Uh, head cells equal zero. Tail cells equal zero. Wire cells equal zero. And then in here, dead cells increment tail tail cells increment head head cells increment wire wire cells increment and then at the bottom here underneath the for loop console dot log generation dead cells, wire cells, tail cells, head cells. And let's just run this and collect this information. Step, 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 step. Okay. So in this image, which is arguably the most complex wire world image uh, that most people will ever run. There are 416,000 dead cells. There's half a million dead cells. There's 55,000 wire cells. And remember, these are the ones that have that expensive operation where they look at their neighbors. And then there's about 4,500 heads and 4,500 tails, which is to be expected, right? Uh, electrons, electron heads and electron tails typically come in pairs. They do things that aren't pairs in places like this. Um, but by and large, the head and tail cells have equal number. So first of all, maybe there's a way to just never iterate over the dead cells, right? So that's the first thing we can do. Let's actually, let's just write down some observations. So half a million dead cells, 50,000 wire cells, and that more or less stays constant. and about 5,000 head, 
tail pairs. Now if we think about it, what's the minimum that we have to do to draw this to the, uh, to, to, uh, to capture all of the changes? Scrap that. That's a that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Okay, so there is an obvious way of reducing the amount of work that we have to do, right? This, the first one is to never loop over head cells. So, optimi er, strategy one, um, don't loop over dead cells. Now, how could we do that? We would need to basically list the non-dead cells and then loop over that. So this is the first strategy we're going to try. Um, also I'll do this. Uh, let's start equal performance dot now and then not let const start equals performance now, const time equals performance now minus start, and then console.log time. So this is the number of milliseconds, more or less, that it takes to do the work right now. So for example, um, here we're seeing 46, but also earlier we saw some like 20s. So how many frames is that? Well, if a thousand milliseconds is one second, if we divide that by the number of milliseconds it takes, we're looking at a frame rate of 21 or 22. That's not great. So we're going to do this. Frame rate 22 FPS. So we're going to try to employ strategy one and then see what that does to the frame rate. Okay, so. The first thing we do is with this initialize. This initialize function is where we get the cells, and then we can say in here, strategy one, list all the cells that do need to change, which are non-dead const non-dead cells equals an array. Sorry, let. Let non-dead cells equal an array. So then in original cells, or after original cells, so now we can say non-dead cells equals an empty array and then we're going to loop over all the cells. So for let y, you know what, we already have one of these. Whoa, that was weird. Okay. For every row in the height, for every column in the width, we get the state and then if old state 
is equal to cell state dot dead sorry is not equal to cell state dot dead then we are going to push non dead cells push and then we're going to store the index of this so const index equals y times width plus x push index so now non dead cells is a list of every cell that could change specifically the index of every cell um, the index is basically you know how do I explain it? If you've got a 2D grid, like um, like this. So this is a one, two, three row and five column grid, or it has a width of five and a height of three. If I put an X here, not an X, I'll change this to a circle. If I put a circle here, it's X, is 0, 1, 2, 3. It's the third one, so 0, 1, 2, 3. And its y is 0, 1. Its index is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we loop over 5, 6, 7, 8. So how do you get the index? You add the x to the y times the width. And that's what we're doing here. We're adding the x to the y times the width. And just like we can get the index from the x, y, and width, we can get the x and y from the index and the width. So now down here, for every cell, we're going to say strategy 1 for every non-dead cell. So for let index or let i equal zero, i is less than non dead cells dot length i plus plus, and we can just store that locally. Const len equals I'll just change this to num non dead cells, and that equals non dead cells dot length. So. We get const x equals, okay, const index equals um, non, num non dead cells i. Const x equals index mod width. And then const y equals index minus x divided by width. And then we just put the same thing in there. Yep. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. There might be a bug in here. Only one way to find out. Load failed. Evaluating old cells yx. Okay. So. Here's the error. Um. There it is. Hmm. Oh, because there's no old cells yet. That's why. Okay. Reset. So actually, this reset needs to go up here first. 
Um, no, it doesn't. I'm just going to keep it down there again, and instead of old cells, so we'll call this state, and we'll call this original cells, and you know what, we can just put it in here. And index can just go in here. Nice. Let's try that again. Seems to have worked. Advance is failing. Num non dead cells. Num non dead cells. X is index percent width. Let's test this. In an empty page. Um, Now you know what? There. Advance. Num non dead cells. I is undefined. Why? Num non dead cells. Dot. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that was that was funny. There we go. I was trying to use a number like an array. Okay. Let's try it again. Advance. Get rid of this breakpoint. Seems to work. It looks the same. Let's look at our numbers. Okay. We are immediately down. Okay, so it might be that the console log slows things down. It does. Okay. I wonder how much console log contributes to the speed of what's being logged. But now, for the most part, okay, there's a 109, okay. Let's just see what's going on. Timelines, and Comment out the performance now. And the plus plus. Delete, record, play. And pause and stop. Sort the frames by total time. Here's some big ones. So there's a lot of them that are like in this case seven or eight or nine milliseconds, but then these ones are pretty high. 32. Animation frame run advance
oops, excuse me. So advance, update paper. This one, run, advance, update paper. Strange. Let's try it in a different browser. Clear memory. Performance, start, play. Seems to me it's actually running kind of slow in Firefox, although again, that might just be because we were collecting performance data. No, it does seem to run slower in Firefox. Ugh. Okay, let's recollect. It would help if I clicked start. There we go. And stop. Flame chart, please. Huh. Is update paper being called multiple times in a single advance? Update paper. No. Update paper. Initialize to draw to. Draw to, draw to. Something's not adding up. Also, just going to pop this out into its own window. Oh. Twenty seconds ought to be enough, and then flame chart. Still, that's interesting. So here's garbage collection. Mm, not much. Oh, here we go. 242, 246, or 256. So these reference GUI.js, GUI.js, line 242 is update paper, and then 256 is a for each. Okay. Hmm. 
not the end of the world. Um, and also, that's not the explanation that I was hoping for of why there's sometimes multiple papers, update papers, inside a single advance. This might just be a weird logging thing. Probably not. Not sure. Regardless, update paper is taking the majority of the time of advance. So... I will say this though, strategy one is a success. There's almost definitely some further improvements we can make, uh, you know, working smarter, not harder. Let's see, update paper. takes this data here's another thing we can do the same information that we use to avoid iterating on things unnecessarily in strategy one we can push through to the GUI so non-dead cells we can pass in and then draw to data then we can say non-dead cells I wonder if that works or if it throws an error. No error. Good. Console.log, non dead cells. There. Okay. So we can then say if non dead cells isn't null, then We'll iterate over that, else, here, I like doing this instead, equals null goes on top. So this is what we do when we don't have the additional context that strategy one provides. Otherwise, we use this exact same logic to iterate over non-dead cells. Let's try that. Cool. And then in Firefox. Seems to run a little faster. And let's start the performance and record 20 seconds or so. I lost track, so I'm just going to stop that, stop that, and then flame chart. Well, that's much better. Look at all this idle time. So, running at the speed that we've got right now in a request animation frame gives us a ton of idle time 
meaning the work that needs to be done every frame for Firefox to animate Wireworld this way is less than the amount uh, uh, takes less than the amount of time uh, available to maintain the frame rate of the web page. So that's pretty neat. I wonder what else we can learn from here. Um, most of the time, okay, update paper, advance, and then the for each. No surprises there. Um, no. And again, if we try it in Safari. Break out the window, timelines, record. And stop and pause. Frames. I wish there was a flame tree in, I guess this is the flame tree in Safari, but, and we're seeing here a bunch of work in JavaScript and then a little paint. And then a little work in JavaScript and then a little paint. Okay. In here, run, advance, update paper. The majority of the work is still in update paper. In fact, it's in put image data. Okay, I'll be right back. Going to, you know what, first I'll commit this and tag it. So what did I change in the GUI? I changed up here, the initial state, and then in engine, I changed this delay stuff up here and this recompute stuff. Yeah, this this is where Git can get hairy because I made multiple kinds of changes to the same file. I should have stopped and staged what I had done first. So that's not dead. Compute delay, stage lines, recompute and run. That is all related to timing and got rid of that. Okay, let's look at that engine. Um, not too bothered by that actually. Playing, playing, recompute. Okay, so first thing we did was added support for the speed sliders uh, for the for adjustable speed in non turbo mode added support for adjustable speed in non turbo mode and then um, GUI state is now initialized based on the 
values of the UI element uh, in the UI elements, i.e. the speed slider. So that's a, that's a change. Oopsie, forgot that one. Amend. Okay, now this I'm gonna call strategy one. Um, one second. This generation stuff. Strategy one. Strategy one. And the rest is unimportant. That's important. And I'll ditch the other changes. Let me just make sure that that's still working. No, it's not. Parser error. Well, thanks for nothing, Safari. Different browsers are better at different um, different aspects of oopsie of web inspection and debugging. There we go. Engine. Draw to. Huh. Oh, that's why. There's an extra curly brace. There we go. And run prettier. Strategy one, only iterate over non-dead cells. As you can see, when I finish an episode, I use a git tag to label the last commit from that episode. We aren't at the end of this episode yet, but I just implemented strategy one, and I don't think I'm going to be making any changes to it. So I'm going to tag it strategy one. Strategy one. which is loop over non-dead cells. Is that how I want to do it? No, I'll just call it strategy one. Yeah, because the explanation is in the commit message. Cool. And push. Okay, I'm going to be right back. Need to get a beverage.
Right. Where were we? Yeah, I should list our frame rate again. Not our frame rate. It should be. I should actually say um, runtime. Running time. About 11 milliseconds. No, wait. It wasn't 11. Yeah, it was like 45. Up to 45 milliseconds. And that was just for the engine, engine running time. It's pretty exciting. It is nothing compared to the hyperspeed uh, algorithm that we are going to eventually see if I can implement it. But you know, this is now fast enough that someone can watch and get a sense of what activities are going on in different parts of the Wireworld com uh, computer. For example, Um, in here, there seem to be some bits of data that are just going constantly around in a loop, right? Like that, and like that. And as they cross over the top of that loop on the left-hand side, they propagate over to this diode, and they terminate. That's interesting. But next to them, there are these signals that are running up and down the sides. And sometimes they send information back down. So here, look, there's twin signals coming up like this, and then boom, they kind of collide up here and they send information down. And this looks more or less like the pattern that we would see in these loops. And this, this pattern of, uh, you know, wire loops and wires that we see up here is kind oopsie. Is kind of similar down here, except these loops are kind of combined with some interesting logic and stuff. And that's interesting. And we know that these more interesting loops down here are in use because there's a whole bunch of signals going through them and those signals are changing over time. What else? There's this signal. And it goes in. And meanwhile another but this this is different there's some data in here and it goes up huh and it goes over and down and it terminates now there's different data It occurs to me we might need an epilepsy warning on this channel, for this project at least. But look at this! We now have a digit 2 
in the ones place of this five digit counter. And the pattern of that two, these one, two, three, four, five lit up areas correspond with this, 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 this. And it's a different pattern. This is a different pattern than what we see over here. So this is representing a zero, and this is representing a two. Anyway, so by skipping over all the dead cells and only iterating over the wire cells, and, sorry, the, uh, the, the non-dead cells, the cells that are either a wire, a head, or a tail, we've been able to speed up the algorithm substantially. But still, the majority of the cells that we're iterating over are unnecessary, and we'll actually calculate that. So first, I will go back in here into advance and say const start equals performance dot now const end or const time equals performance dot now minus start console dot log time so let's just get whoopsie Safari has its quirks clear filters there they are okay let's try this again reset play and pause what are we seeing here So maximum of 36. I should have done medium median measurement from the first strategy, which I can still do actually. So I'm going to say 15 milliseconds median for median 15 milliseconds and then naive approach median and we will time this again using the old method so I'm gonna stash this timing code and then I'm going to rewind to here reset hard I can do this because I've got the um, upstream commit on github and it's tagged so I can reset to it pretty easily. Um, but now with this older code, I can apply OK, or there's a conflict. Boring. Let's just use this stash as like a snippet. New cells. And then at the 
bottom generation. Can't be bothered. Okay, clear. So this is the older version. Oof, you can tell how much slower it is. Okay, just running that. And stop. Let's grab all these. Log. Okay, sort. And then take the median. Huh. Okay, so I'm going to say 27. So, most of the gains from strategy one were actually in our change to the uh, update paper method from the looks of things, which is fine. Had to happen. We had a slow method. Um, just going to look at the older version in Firefox. Uh, in performance mode. Clearly the operation that is in update paper is expensive. And so making a, you know, I'll make a note of that. Um, update paper. No, you know what? Not for now. Okay, yes. Update paper is one bottleneck. Okay, so in the flame chart, we zoom in. Yeah, just the amount of stuff, the amount of time spent in update paper was huge before strategy one. So at the very least, we've got that, but here's what I'd like to know now. Instead of this timing code, so we're now back to strategy one, and I want to know how many misses we've got. Let misses equals zero. And, you know, we're really not too interested actually in the dead tail and head operations because they're gonna have to happen anyway. And they're pretty straightforward. Um, the most expensive operation in the engine is in the wire. So, in here, we're going to say else misses plus plus. Are we? No, we're not. We're going to say else if numhead neighbors is equal to zero, then misses plus plus. So when numhead neighbors, you know, when when something like Wireworld is running, the logic that you know the the interesting logical operations are happening locally in places where wires have more than two neighbors. That's the interesting bit. We actually like this behavior when there's three or more. That's really cool. When there's no neighbors, none, then that wire should never have run this code in the first place. 
So that's why we're counting the number of times that a wire has had no neighbors in the first place that were heads. And we're counting the number of misses there. Um, and we're going to count the number of wires. So, oh, but we already know that. Um, We can count that once up here and initialize. So non-dead cells. No, you know what? Misses. We can do this. Console.log misses. And then as a percentage, 100 math.seal. 100 times the number of misses divided by the number of non-dead cells. So the number of non-dead cells is the total number of cells we're iterating over. And heads and tails are going to be roughly constant. Actually, we don't need this anymore. Is this a decent metric, or should I also measure the total number of wires? Yeah, this is fine. And we're going to do this in Safari. Pause. Okay. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. This shows us a whole lot of information about how much improvement we can make on top of this. So, oh boy. So, every update, there's about 50,000 wires that we don't have to touch at all. They don't matter. And we're doing the work anyway. And that amounts to 78% of all the cells we are iterating over. That is significant overhead still. So I will write these down. About 50,000 still. So... Fifty, oopsie, 50,000 wire cells with no neighbors, roughly 80% of all cells we're, we loop over. So that is a whole lot of unnecessary work, a ton of unnecessary work. Now you might say to yourself, Res, who cares? It's pretty. We know that, you know, the, the work that it's doing is well within the frame budget of the fastest speed on the slider. So who cares? Well, here's why I care. This checkbox, Turbo is supposed to make this thing run as fast as possible without interrupting the responsiveness of the page. And right now it does absolutely nothing. And one of the reasons why it does nothing is because if we were to wire it up with the engine the way it's currently implemented, it would... Um, I mean, we might see some... some speed but it would come at a performance hit very quickly you know it's cool that we fit in the frame budget with one update every uh, request animation frame 
But if we want to pack in 10 or 50, um, then we need to find some other places where we can optimize further. And we're not yet ready to shove this into a web worker or rely on WebAssembly or, um, you know, throw this on the GPU, which we will experiment with in the future. But this first strategy has gotten us pretty far, but not far enough. Um, You know what? We can simulate my dissatisfaction by calling advance twice when we run. Let's try that. Let's see if that actually works. It does, and actually, because the Wireworld computer is um, implemented with a, a spacing of six, if we do this, there we go. Um, and let's do this, false. Update equals true, or just update. And then down here, if update, then we do a draw to. Let's just see what that does. Uh, nothing, that's weird. Oh. Sorry, update. Let's try that again. So now we're, it's interesting that parts of the, um, parts of the image don't seem to be moving at all, right? And that's largely because a lot of what Wireworld does with electrons is it just maintains state. So this ROM, it's not getting any new information. It's got a little loop in here. And this loop is like one, two, three, four, five, six. It's a loop of six, right? And so if I, oopsie, if I pause this, and do a step. Um, sorry, one second. So I should do this. Update equals true because it's exposed elsewhere. So if we look at this part of the image and we advance it, if we look right here at this cycle step 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 so let me just wind it so here's the electron head up here and then one two three four five six there's no new information coming down the wire the only signal is from this loop and it is triggering this loop to send a signal this way, which represents the digit zero, which sends a signal this way. But just like this circle, all of this has a phase or whatever you want to call it, a, a, a period of six. And if we compare so here, let me just do this. Um, so in two separate tabs, I've got two different wire worlds. If I advance this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
and I go back and forth between them. There's no difference between the state of this ROM as it is now and six steps ago. There's no new information coming through the wire. Ten years ago, I thought to myself, well, there's a whole lot of changes happening here. Maybe we can identify when there's no change based on the period and just sort of freeze this part of the simulation, right? Because what need is there to update this uh, when composing the image? That kind of thing. And yeah, there's some merit in that idea. Um, that idea is kind of a hint at a broader idea. Why is this running so fast? <laughs> Not sure. Um, so now we know that we can fit, I guess, we know that we can fit six of these things in a single frame. That would be fun to check in the performance monitor of Firefox. Oops. Um, performance stop. And then flame chart. Yeah, we're going to ignore this because that was the breakpoint. Yeah, we still have some idle time more often than not. We do, it looks like we do skip a frame from time to time. Um, garbage collector is calling for some reason. Not sure why, but anyway. Um, update paper. Because we only need to update the paper once per frame, we can actually run this thing a whole lot. So how about this? For let i equals zero, i is less than 100, i plus plus. Advance, false. Let's see what happens. Oh, multiple of six. Um, 120. Not gonna lie, I'm pretty impressed with how fast this is running in modern browsers. Okay, so now it's starting to chug. And that's good news. We wanna be able to see that there's a limitation to the gains that we saw with strategy one. There's two. That didn't take long at all. That took very little time. Okay. So for now, we're just going to leave that at advance. Um, and then... Okay, let's see. Advance. Yeah, so... Draw to, and that was with a console log thrown in there too. <laughs> Gonna get rid of that and the misses. So engine is back to the state it was. Okay. It's honestly thrilling to see how fast this advances compared with the Flash version from 2011, 2010.
Like, this is... This is... You know... Twenty ten Res Mason would be very happy with what we've got going on. Although I should set this up. The generation counter should be updated. So draw two um and I'm gonna do and you know what? I'm gonna rename draw two to render and render. So it's a render function. And Wireworld engine initialize. And we're going to call this GUI render. Nah, you know what? Update paper is fine. And then we'll rename the weird function names in GUI in a little while. But generation. Um, and then in here, state, initial state, okay, generation zero. Paper. If generation isn't equal to data dot generation, then generation equals data generation, and we update the label. So okay labels dot generation dot I guess inner text am I using inner HTML no here quit flash inner HTML versus okay just inner HTML let's just get this in before the end of the stream versus inner text. Oh. Label MDN. Text. Oh, text content, label text. Okay, dot text. Oh no, wait, set text does what? Text content. I'll just try this. And then generation. Can't find variable generation. Console.log labels. Weird. 
Oh, state dot, state dot. Object, generation. Okay, that's enough of that. Oh, state dot generation. Elements target. Not finding it. Bottom left generation. Weird. Great syntax highlighting in Firefox or er, Safari. Set text. Okay. Render, render, render. Okay. State dot generation is one. Good. There it is. <laughs> wow, that is slow. That is so slow. Who boy. Ten years ago, I rolled my own uh, counter renderer. <laughs> and I might have to do it again, just based on how absolutely slow that is. Why is it so slow? GUIJS generation dot set text. So if I just leave that out for now, it'll probably go back to being fast. It is. Wow. Whew. Unbelievable. Well, that's something to write home about. So, to make clear what's happening, the canvas can update pretty quickly because it's kind of just a texture on a rectangle. Like when the browser renders it, it's no big deal. And when the browser updates the data that populates it, it's no big deal. But, but, to set the text on a label, the browser has to typeset it.
No, maybe it's maybe it was just me. Okay, I gotta test this. Um, super fast. So here, I'll do it in Firefox again. Performance before. Flame chart. So update paper 243. I don't know what Gecko is doing, but I mean it's compositing and painting and stuff. Sorry, it's it's not 243. It's like will it even tell me? Update paper is doing, okay, four milliseconds. Update paper, so 28% of total cost. And then we turn this on and we run this again. I mean, this is better. I'm not sure what was going on before. Stop. And then call tree for everything. And update paper is 28. Okay, so it's not that big a difference. I don't know what was going on before. I mean, I'm glad I recorded that. Because the speed at which it was updating was terrible. Okay, I won't worry about it. This is good. I won't have to roll my own renderer, although I will do it if I have to. Um, cool. <laughs> that was weird for a second. Yeah, I don't know what caused that. Okay. And quick question. Back to zero. So, GUI dot JS. When it first calls set paper or initialize paper, we need to set the generation text. Okay. And if we advance it and then drop something in, back to zero. Cool. Okay. Um, what else? Index generation. Might as well put zero in there already. I think that's where it belongs. <laughs> nope. That's where it belongs. Cool. Okay. We got our little generation counter now. Zoom works. Speed works. Pretty much everything works, and so... In the last minute I've got, I am going to, well, call prettier. Cool, no changes. Um,
Oops. Renamed draw2 to render in the engine. GUI now uh, populates the generation time uh, counter and um, the last thing I want is this text has no implementation, has no implementation. And we're going to change this to this project is a work in development. Is in is still in development. Beta. Do I want that? I'll change it to this. Um, Wire World Player. Beta. Cool. And in here, font size zero point five M uh, font oops oops text transform. You know what? We're going to change this to span class equals beta badge. Beta. And then in here, layout.css. dot beta badge um, display inline block background red color white font size 0.25 m border radius 0.125 m let's just see what that looks like uh, it's way too small. Um, 1M. 0.2M. Weird. Padding. No, margin. 0.5M. I meant padding. Too big. Zero point one M. Um, border radius. Zero point five M. Nope. One M. And padding point five M. K. 0.5M, 0.1M, wrong way. 0.1M, 0.5M. Cute. Margin bottom 1M. Let's just try that. Nope. Okay, I'm not going to mess around with it too much tonight. Um, ooh, transform, rotate uh, 45 degrees. Minus 45. And 6M.
there's better ways of doing this, like going into going into the web inspector and taking a look at it. I'm happy with this though. Uh, text transform. Uppercase. Cool. Okay. Enough of that. Replacing note in about box with beta badge. Um, and that is where things will end tonight. So again, strategy one is great, but we still have a lot of work cut out for us. Um, most of the work being done in our loop is completely unnecessary. And if we can figure out how to avoid iterating over these wires in the first place, we'll make significant headway. Also, we can give each cell a list of its neighbors so we don't have to do a nested four. But... We'll see. There's definitely some strategies to try next time. Episode three. Well, thanks very much for uh, hanging around. This is Res Mason signing off from the skybox in the corner of the level.